Welcome to the Weekly Lead Podcast. This is week 10, and I'm Becky Tirabasi, your host. My goal is to inspire you weekly to become leaders based on the following four tenets of leadership. First, loyalty to God's Word. I've been challenging people for over two decades to read through the entire Bible. This year, read through the entire Bible with me, and I will give you a peek of the week of what's coming using the Change Your Life Daily Bible. Second, encourage others to change the atmosphere in every room you enter. I mean that. Could you change the atmosphere in every room you enter? If you are on um, YouTube, you can see me holding up this little sign. Someone gave it to me. All it says is, be kind. So what did I do? I placed it at the door when I'm leaving to get my keys by the key rack and then to head into my car. And it makes me smile every single time. Be kind is just that one thought to help me be encouraging to others by the way I look at them and how I treat them. Same with you. Advocates is the third thing. Advocates for the young generation. To see yourself as a culture changer for the young generation. Yes, you, no matter how old you are, no matter your profession. One of my friends is a dock builder, and he mentors a high schooler every single year. From the high school, they send a student who wants to learn what he does. You can be an advocate for the young generation and D, devoted to prayer. Pray more, pray specific. And as Maverick City Music sings, keep praying. So this week, I've been told that a good podcast always has guests, and one day I will have live guests, but today I'm going to bring a guest into our time together whom I love. He wrote a book in 1797. His name is Wilbur William Wilberforce, and he wrote the book Real Christianity, and I know you're going to love it. And one of the things that is so impressive to me about Wilberforce from 1797 is that he talks about the Bible first and foremost as one of the ways he was able to impact the culture around him. And for those of you who may not be familiar with William Wilberforce, he was um, responsible in many ways for fighting for the abolition of slavery in England over a 30-year, almost 40-year um, fight in Parliament. He was not willing to give it up, and he succeeded. What was his foundation? Loyalty to God's Word. He starts out in the first chapter of his book, Real Christianity, which he was told, please don't publish this book. No one's going to buy it, and you're not even a theologian. You're a parliamentarian. Why would you write a book? And he he wrote from the beginning, I am compelled to to say, to tell those around me why I'm doing what I'm doing. And he writes this, carefully studying the Bible will reveal to us our own ignorance of things. It will challenge us to reject a superficial understanding of Christianity and impress upon us that it is imperative not simply to be religious or moral, but to master the Bible intellectually, to integrate its principles into our lives morally and put into action what we have learned practically. He says, the Bible is one of God's greatest gifts to humanity. So you can tell why I love the book, Real Christianity. I've uh, developed a Bible study from it, The Eight Traits of Genuine Faith. I've taught it in uh, Newport Beach, California, two, two times at least. I've taught it in Washington, D.C., two times at least. I love this book from 1797. William Wilberforce has influenced my life, and in part, he loves the Bible loved the Bible like I love the Bible, and I want you to love the Bible. Now, this week we're reading in the Old Testament, number 6, verses 24 to 26. They're some of the oldest scripture found um, in archaeology that read this way. This is the ritual law of the Nazarites, who vow to bring these offerings to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with a special blessing. You're going to read this this week in the book of Numbers. May the Lord bless you 
and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. What if you were to write that on the wall of uh, your house and um, see that every single morning when you wake up? Well, that's the intention of the Word of God, to receive blessings and to give blessings. In the New Testament, in uh, Mark chapter 12, you're going to read the words of Jesus. Some of you have read letter Bibles. But what does he say? What does Jesus say that the Proverbs often says? Watch out. Be on guard. He also says, give generously out of love for God, not because you have to give. So many um, nuggets of inspiration every single day, if you would read the Bible. Um, I always say, with those in your family, with those in your church, what is God saying? And it begins to say it with those you read the Bible together with. In the same way, you become more generous givers. Psalm 51 today is like a confession session. In my prayer partner, my partner prayer notebook, it's an app at the app store. It's on the on Amazon in a three-ring binder. It's the same notebook I've used for 38 years as a pattern in prayer. And what do I do every single day? A confession session. Praise, admit, request, and thanks. Those are my four kinds of prayer. And that admission section is to start out every single day. Search me, know me, test me. Psalm 51 is one of those confession session prayers. If you're at a place where you must uh, humble yourself and come before God and others, do it with the help of a psalm. You'll find every day you read a psalm and many of them lead to confession. And then the Proverbs says, the wicked speak perverse language. That's just a, a, a sign to me that you can remove perverse language from your vocabulary and move away from wickedness and ways that hurt and harm other people. And that's a perfect segue to E for encouraging others. You know, um, the lead the weekly lead podcast has really come from the fact that I have a uh, have established a prayer and fellowship house in Washington D.C. and it's called the Lead House, and I built it on these tenets of of leadership, loyalty to God's word, encouraging to others, advocacy for the young generation, and devotion to prayer. And through um, the first year of working in Washington D.C., I used the traits, the eight traits from Wilbur Force's book in order to change the atmosphere of every room I entered. And the eight traits of genuine faith that Wilbur Force talks about include Bible reading and prayer and humility and maturity. They're words that don't change over time, but with every culture, we have to be compelled to apply them to the world we live in. And one of the uh, phrases that um, Wilberforce uses in his book. He says, I believe it could be said that never has our culture needed more than it does today Christianity. Now, this was written in 1797. This is why I love this book. It is contemporary. It's relevant. I have purchased dozens of these books. Sometimes they're out of print. Sometimes they're back in because I believe they speak to the now, to leaders now. But here's his word. I encourage you, he says. I love that. I encourage you, Wilberforce says, to take your role in society with a great deal of serious consideration. And in part, I moved to Washington, D.C. and got a house. I don't have a job there. I don't even know really um, why I was compelled to buy or rent a house there and establish a prayer and fellowship house other than as a guest chaplain of the United States House of Representatives in 2000 or 2017, I said a little prayer in the dais 
on the house floor. And in that moment, I felt like God said, keep coming back and keep praying. And so in establishing uh, uh, the lead house in Washington, D.C., and it's got one of those beautiful little bronze um, plaques outside the front door that just says the lead house established 2019. I'm trying to change the atmosphere. Every single person who walks by that house may or may not know what LEAD stands for, but everyone in the house knows that we are going to be loyal to God's Word. We are going to encourage each other. We're going to change the atmosphere of every room we walk in, and we're going to be advocates for the young generation and devoted to prayer. And as advocates for the young generation, William Wilberforce, you you know, this is amazing to me. The first chapter, the first page of his book talks about what? The young generation. And here's what he says. He says, I hope you don't think I'm being arrogant or overly harsh on cultural Christians. But look at the facts. Do cultural Christians view Christian faith as important enough to make it a priority when teaching their children what they believe and why they believe it? Or do they place greater emphasis on their children getting a good education than on learning about the things of God? First page first few paragraphs of a book on real Christianity. He is speaking to parents about being advocates for the young generation. He's not speaking as a politician. He's speaking as a parent. He's speaking as a parent to parents about the education of their children and that it should include, I think about this all the time, Should it include the Ten Commandments? How can it hurt any child to learn, don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal, don't kill? I mean, how could that possibly hurt a child? Or the golden rule, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. These great commandments. As we teach our children the ways of God, we're teaching them how to live one with God, the first four commandments, and then the next commandments with others. As we read in the Bible, Old Testament and New, what are we given? We're given um, ways to impact our world, to honor God with our lives, to um, grow in um, spirituality and maturity over time um, and not be stagnant And we want the same for our children. I took William Wilberforce's book many years ago, and not only did I write Eight Traits of Genuine Faith, I began to write empty essays. And they were those essays about why our young generation is empty. And much of it was talking about our education system or um, why children go to college and what they um, major in when they get there. Is it fun? Is it fraternity and sorority? Is it for social? Or are they there to impact their world for the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they have a strength of faith? Our parents at, at the youngest age possible beginning to say, I'm an advocate for the young generation, and I'm going to change the world through my own child and his own love for God and faith. And finally, devoted to prayer. Wilberforce loved to pray. And I just want to read um, how he talks about prayer. And again, can you imagine this is written in 1797? And here we are, in the 21st century, reading these words that reading these words that seem amazingly applicable to today, they are these: We live in difficult times. He writes, "Pray for this nation." We have all the marks of a declining civilization. Pray that the God who hears and answers the prayers of His people might intervene on behalf of our country and bring a spiritual renewal that might save the nation. People of unbelief might think you're kidding yourself to think 
that prayer might make a difference. They might think that you're like some superstitious person depending on God because you're weak. They might compare you to those who are really a bit out of touch. The fact is, God cares for the nation in which his servants live and serve him, and he favors and blesses the land of the righteous. I find it necessary to affirm that we face nationally and internationally the result of our own moral decline. And he talks about that you would pray, pray for the work of those in this country that we need to accomplish. Pray for us. Pray for us. I want to say that I established the Lead House in Washington, D.C. as a prayer and fellowship house to encourage the members of Congress to pray for our nation, not for people, not for causes, but to pray for revival in our nation. And if you would join me, if you would develop your own Lead House, loyalty to God's Word, read through the Bible with the people in your sphere of influence every single day. It just takes 15 minutes. Start a group text and begin to say, this is what God's saying to me. This is what I think we should do. If you would encourage others, you know, the simple little change the atmosphere in every room you enter, put up a little sign that says, be kind. What might happen if people just see that when they walk in your door? Would you be advocates for the young generation to talk about education? I can't tell you how many people in my church I say, why don't you go to college? Why don't you go back to school? Why don't you go get that degree? Why don't you just take one or two classes in seminary? Why not? Why not go keep going and let God use you to change the world in which you live, and finally be devoted to prayer, whether it's a prayer meeting in your office place, in your home every morning, in your church uh, once a week, be a part of a prayer meeting, a prayer group praying for revival in our nation, which Charles Finney said in the Second Great Awakening was simply a new obedience to God. Will you? Invite someone to subscribe to the weekly lead. Would you join me in inviting people to lead with loyalty to God's word, encouragement to others, advocacy for the young generation, and devotion to prayer? I'd be grateful. Amen? Amen.